The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our webinar, Steam Trap Monitoring Wireless Solutions with ISA 100, hosted by the ISA 100 Wireless Compliance Institute. Thank you all for joining us today. All attendees will be muted for the duration of this meeting. You can submit questions at any time using the question panel on your screen. Your questions will only be seen by the presenters, and we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Our speakers today are TJ Secord, Technical Resource Manager of Armstrong International, and Brian Armstrong, Solutions Specialist for Armstrong International. TJ started his career as a project manager for a major corn processing facility where he gained experience with STEAM in a real-world setting. In 2007, TJ started at Armstrong in the Smart Services Group, <clears throat> where he focused on STEAM system management and real-time monitoring of STEAM traps. Since starting with the Smart Services Group, TJ has helped hundreds of customers manage their STEAM systems, where he oversaw the, the entries of nearly 2.5 million STEAM traps into the trap management platform Sage and legacy platform Steamstar. Brian started with Armstrong International in the fall of 2016 and has recently transitioned to the wireless products division and will be a solutions specialist for not only flow measurement but also wireless. Brian is also a fifth generation Armstrong family member. At this time, I'll turn the mic over to Brian to go over today's agenda. All righty. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, happy Wednesday. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Um, today, we're just going to go over a brief agenda real quick on what we'll be talking about. So first, as Michael just, just gave, he gave a nice introduction on myself and TJ Secord. Um, we'll also talk about, you know, the introduction to industrial wireless, ISA 100 wireless industry standard. And then we'll really get into the meat of our presentation here, Steam Trap Monitoring Wireless Solutions with ISA 100. And then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with a summary and a brief uh, question and answer. Alrighty, so let's talk about a brief introduction to industrial wireless. Um, wireless technologies have become increasingly popular in the industrial automation as growing numbers of system integrators, government agencies, and industrial operators continue to turn to wireless solutions for their applications. Uh, wireless networks can be quickly deployed to transmit data to areas without existing cable infrastructures and serve multiple applications. So here you can see uh, a, a brief examples of simple industrial wireless networks and also various application examples and of course today we'll be talking about the armstrong wireless steam trap monitoring as well as there's other applications such as remote process monitoring tank level monitoring and multiple measurement and controls So just some brief ISA 100 wireless uh, fast facts. Um, just want to highlight a couple of the following. It's an end user driven standard uh, meeting all current and future industrial needs. Um, it enables applications to be end to end SIL2 certification. Uh, they are readily available ISA 100 wireless modules and stacks, as well as these enable fast track development and go to markets. So now let's talk about a couple of the benefits of the ISA 100 wireless instrumentation. Um, as you can see on the left here, these are really going to be the main benefits. So cost savings, improved reliability, improved visibility, improved control, and improved safety. And really there's one I'd, I'd like to highlight here. Um, typically there is a major cost savings opportunity of 50% relative to traditional wiring, wiring at projects. Also, the execution of a wireless project on average takes only one fifth of tradi the traditional time. So 
So now I like to show the ISA 100 wireless product portfolio. Um, as Michael mentioned, you know, Armstrong International is a proud partner of the ISA 100 group. Um, we, we enjoy using the ISA 100 and the infrastructure. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the steam trap monitoring solution that Armstrong has to offer. Um, here is just a, a brief overview of the multi-vendor uh, product portfolios covering wireless infrastructures, devices for measurement and control, as well as a broad and growing portfolio for applications around energy efficiency, health, safety, and environment, and also asset management. So again, just want to run through the agenda one more time. Uh, what TJ and I will be talking about here is really the steam trap monitoring of uh, wireless solutions with ISA 100. We'll briefly go into you know, why we want to monitor steam traps, the historical steam trap management methods, common monitoring applications, as well as some key applications that uh, you'll be looking for. And then we'll wrap it up with really the benefits of, of why we like to use the ISA 100 infrastructure with our steam trap monitoring devices and some actual real uh, case examples. So let's start out with why do we wanna monitor a steam trap? And really there's two reasons why we wanna monitor the condition of a steam trap. One, we wanna know if that steam trap is either failed open, which means the steam is either leaking or blowing through the, the steam trap, or we wanna monitor the condition of if, if it fails closed. And this means the steam trap is plugged or the temperature of the steam trap is cold. So again, that first condition that we're talking about on why we wanna monitor a steam trap. We wanna know if the steam trap is failing open and, if, and that means it's either leaking or blowing through. And the reason we wanna monitor and control this is because of the following reasons, one, it's going to cause an increased uh, back pressure if it's failing open. This means it's going to reduce the flow for surrounding steam traps. And essentially, this could affect other steam traps down, uh, downstream of the pipe. Also, too, uh, and this is probably the most important one, steam losses here, monetary losses. You know, if a steam trap is blowing through, if it's leaking, that means we're losing steam. That's, that means we're losing money. Uh, the third issue here is safety. If, uh, if we have a failed steam trap, that always means there's a safety hazard involved. And lastly, environmental issues. Um, you know, if steam is leaking, that means steam is going into the atmosphere. This could cause uh, environmental issues. So again, the second condition here uh, of why we wanna monitor um, the condition of a steam trap is failed close. And again, this means that the steam trap is plugged or cold. And really what this is gonna cause, it's gonna cause wet steam. And the wet steam could cause water hammering, which is a safety issue, uh, turbine damage, erosion on valves and reducers, could damage equipment. So again, we wanna monitor the condition of that uh, steam trap and know if it's either failed open or failed close. Also, too, here, it can cause a stalling or flooded of a heat exchanger. So, again, it can destroy equipment. It can decrease in production. Uh, it reduces heat transfer, process losses, and it also causes uh, thermal stress. So, here we just like to show, you know, really the importance of steam trap monitoring and, and why we want to control and monitor the steam trap. And on the left, you can see this is showing the steam loss through an orifice drip trap and a tracer application. And on the right, we're showing the dollar loss through an orifice drip trap and a tracer application. So really what we're just trying to show here is where the dolling savers savings can be at by real-time monitoring a steam trap. So again, it's critical that we need to monitor the steam trap in order to not lose money, to not lose energy and not lose steam. And now I'm going to hand it over to TJ Secord, and he's going to take it from here on some key applications, um, some common monitoring applications, and um, some steam trap surveys. It's all you, TJ. Thank you, Brian, and good morning, everybody. Um, wanted to just talk with you a little bit about the different survey styles. So in the past, um, when a steam trap 
population was being maintained. Uh, traditionally, people would go out with a uh, pen and paper and record the, the trap conditions to test those conditions of those traps. It, they could use a multitude of different ways, temperature, they would listen to it, um, put a screwdriver on the steam trap and put your ear up to it to listen to it. Um, so all those those different styles of of checking the trap, you know, from very, very crude to more sophisticated electronic stethoscopes and things like that. Um, well, with with Armstrong, we always are, are pushing the boundaries of uh, bringing new technology and trying to revolutionize the industry a little bit. And uh, we just recently came out with the device that's shown here, the Sage UMT. And that is a, a device that's a little bit smarter in that, and it makes that process a little bit simple, more simple. But we still have to go around and test the traps. So you, you put the device on the trap, it records it, um, and uh, we have a point in time event. So uh, we know what that condition is at that time. We don't know what it's gonna be in five minutes because we're gonna be moving on to the next trap. So um, to, to do that, to, to help improve that process, we now have uh, a wireless monitor. Um, Armstrong's been doing wireless monitoring for uh, 20 years now, um, and we have now the, the the um, ISA protocol, which allows us to expand that even further and and uh, really allows us to bring trap monitoring to the next level. Um, our transmitter, as you can see in the picture here, is a, a non-intrusive unit. Um, it uses acoustics and temperature to detect the trap operation. So it uses some of those technologies that were developed um, back from the putting the, the screwdriver to your ear days uh, and, and making them more intelligent, right? Um, so we, we listen to that and we determine what the trap condition is and then we send that condition back to uh, the, the receiver through the, through the ISA system. Um, the, the monitor, it can go on any type of trap um, manufacturer, uh, if it's over 15 PSI, uh, it can be monitored very easily with the ultrasonic method. And we're not limited to the type of application. Um, so basically, if it's a process or a drip or a tracer, we can, we can monitor all of those um, with, with no setup really that's needed in the, uh, in the transmitter or in the system itself. So some of the common applications that are uh, typically, that, that we've traditionally installed these types of monitors on are gonna be like a, a tracing application or a steam turbine um, or, or something like that where uh, having good quality steam to your, to the service, uh, to the user is going to be the most important thing. Um, we've also obviously monitored uh, traps on, on high pressure traps uh, on boiler headers and distribution because of those potential losses that Brian shared on that slide a couple of slides ago. Um, and then there's always the safety aspect as well. So uh, getting into those hard to reach locations, like if there's a steam trap in a pipe rack or um, a dan any type of location where it's dangerous to get to, you've got to uh, get a lift out or you know, uh, evacuate a, a, an area because of hazardous uh, atmosphere or something like that. Um, that's a, another area where having a, a monitor uh, really excels because then we don't have to send personnel into those locations just to check the steam trap um, and we can find out when that fails immediately. So, um, one application that's been very, very popular has been with, with critical steam trap tracing. Um, so basically what that means is in a, in a, I'm sure many of you could probably talk to this more intelligently than I, but uh, in a refinery or a chemical processing facility, there's a viscous fluid like sulfur or a, a polymer or, or, or something like that where it's temperature critical, right? You have to maintain the temperature on that pipe. And if you don't, it's gonna get 
solidified and now you're cutting pipe to get the, the system back up and running. And so installing trap monitoring on the tracing lines that keep that line warm um, has been a very popular uh, application for this. So in that application, we're monitoring more for a cold trap, right? Because if that trap goes plugged, then they have got the risk of backing up condensate in that tracer line and cooling off that header and potentially solidifying that product. Um, and so th with that application, your savings comes from uh, loss mitigation from a potential plant shutdown uh, versus steam loss. Um, so that has been a very popular um, type of application. Another application would be um, high pressure uh, steam turbines. So um, why would you want to do that? Because if that trap that is um, dripping the steam, so it, it's removing the, the, the condensate that's, that's formed from distribution um, from the steam right at the inlet of that turbine, uh, we want to get that condensate removed so that we don't pass wet steam through that turbine. Um, if you've got water droplets or something like that passing through those, you're going to get extensive blade damage. Um, your turbine is not going to operate as efficiently, and you're going to have to work on your your equipment a lot more often. And and uh, I'm sure that anybody know that has a turbine knows that they're not exactly the most inexpensive thing in the world to work on. So um, you could p potentially uh, decrease that maintenance your maintenance cost and and all of those costs associated with it. So um, you know. Proper maintenance makes things run longer, makes things cheaper to run in the end. So um, another application would be, uh, you know, a process application. So you've got a cr critical steam trap uh, that's that's operating a a critical process. If that process goes down, then your facility starts to uh, lose product or lose production, and you know the cost for that can can escalate very very quickly. And so, by knowing how those steam traps are operating, knowing those steam traps are operating in their proper uh, in a proper condition, uh, really makes it so that we know that your process is operating at its max capacity and um, you're, you're getting the most out of your facility. So, um, so we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but uh, again, what, what are your motivations for monitoring a steam trap? Um, you know, the traditional method is to go out and survey those traps, uh, typically on an annual basis. Some people do it more often, uh, many do it less often, every two, three, five years. Um, so if that's been working, why would we want to monitor a trap so that we know instantaneously when, uh, you know, in the past we've been doing it and, and knowing every year or two has, has been fine. Um, well, really it comes down to a lot of different things and we've, we've kind of discussed some of those, but energy conservation is certainly a strong one. Um, so like Brian said, when a steam trap blows through, the energy from that steam is passing onto your condensate return or is passing into uh, out to the atmosphere if you don't have condensate return. Um, and in the end, that energy is lost, okay? And so that, that energy loss can cost you thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year from just one little steam trap. Uh, so knowing immediately when that trap fails can save you you know that money right it's 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 cost avoidance at that point in time um the other advantage to it so it's a it's a trifecta we we save money on our energy bills we're going to reduce uh your uh, energy waste by reducing your co2 um emissions to the environment and we're going to gain the knowledge and and reduce those emergency calls because a, a trap has failed or something along those lines and, and we have to have to uh, um, drop everything to fix something. Um, so it, it really just comes down to really good maintenance practices. So let's see here. 
This is, uh, sorry, had to think about this for a second. Um, this is kind of a, a, an overview of a application that we've installed uh, a transmitter on at a, at a customer's facility. So um, again, with the turbine application, as I discussed before, uh, they were, the monitors were installed on 50 high pressure steam turbines. Um, they allowed us to, to detect uh, two failed closed steam traps um, and avoid the blade damage that could have been involved with passing um, wet steam or you know actual like water particulate into that steam turbine um, and decrease the the potential uh, turbine maintenance on those turbines. Um, another um, example would be uh, some sulfur tracing applications. So uh, again, like I like I said before, this is where we installed um, steam traps on uh, 130 transmitters on the, the tracing manifolds, and um, we we actually we detected uh, 15 failed closed steam traps. Um, it was I remember this one really well because it was funny because the the customer called me up and said, Hey, we got a problem. The transmitter is not reporting in right. It's, it's reporting that the trap is cold and it's a brand new trap. And I told the customer, I said, did you go out and make sure that uh, the the steam was, was on um, to the trap? And, you know, you kind of get a silent, uh, you know, note on the end of the line. And then he called me back a, a, an hour later and he said, hey, you know what? Actually, the steam wasn't even turned on to the line. They didn't shut off the trap. They actually turned off the steam. So a gremlin went out there and turned off the steam, and they were able to detect that. So um, certainly that's a, a strong case for um, e even detecting uh, failures within our own organi organization um, and, and being able to watch that type of information and, and potentially uh, eliminating a problem with a plugged product line which would have taken the plant down and cost, you know, millions of dollars. And then finally, uh, energy reduction. Um, here's an example of an installation where we installed um, 2,600 uh, monitors on uh, high pressure distribution. We had an, we found an initial failure rate of 19%. So a lot of those traps were were failed. Um, and uh, we were able to, you know, eliminate uh, steam loss that was estimated at uh, about a million dollars, decrease the CO2 emissions of the entire facility by 40%, um, and even put a boiler on standby because the, the load of steam was reduced significantly enough that uh, um, they were able to actually shut down one of their boilers so that they could run on less equipment. So that, uh, um, was a, a big win for for the customer. So I will hand uh, hand the survey back over to Brian. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I uh, look forward to talking to you guys in the question and answer section. So please, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and type them in, and we will address them all at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, TJ. Um, so everyone, you know, just kind of want to to give a brief summary of the the ISA 100 wireless and why you know Armstrong likes to partner and use the ISA 100 infrastructure for our wireless steam trap monitors. Um, first, you know, is going to be the cost. You know, typical conservative cost savings of 10k, you know, per wireless instrument over traditional hardware hardwired installation. So. This is one of the reasons why we like to go uh, with the wireless ISA 100. Uh, you know, the second is speed. As I mentioned earlier, you know, project execution and one fifth of the time that's relative, you know, to the traditional uh, wiring. You know, it's the quickest installation time and you can get your data in just uh, one, one day. Um, you know, thirdly is the performance of the ISA 100. You know, it enables near real time performance. So this is critical when we're monitoring a steam trap. You know, we want to know what that real-time uh, condition is of the, the steam trap. You know, fourth is choice. You know, a large portfolio of the ISA 100 wireless devices by multiple vendors. As we showed earlier in the slide, you know, multiple product vendors. Um, as, you, as you all know, Armstrong is one of those product vendors with our wireless steam trap monitor. 
And fifth is innovation. ISA 100 is always innovating, coming out with new solutions, new ideas. And um, there's also a, a new one out there right now, FEWIO, which is a new cost-effective method to connect remote PLCs to the DCS. So again, just to kind of to summarize also the benefits of ISA 100, and, it, and this is why Armstrong really likes to use our wireless steam trap monitors with the ISA 100 infrastructure for these reasons. One, it's a very secure um, network. Two, the integration part of it, uh, we can add to the wireless coverage uh, network. You know, three is the actual wireless coverage. Um, four, is scalability. You know, five, and, and this is really, I think, one of our, our biggest um, strengths here is the installation time. It, it's, it's an easy installation and we're up and running quickly. And, and lastly, as, as you all know, all the different um, product vendors with the ISA 100, we can really choose the best manufacturer for uh, the best application. And in our case, you know, Armstrong, we expertise, expertise in the steam traps. So we can help out with any steam trap monitoring um, application along with the ISA 100 network. So now I just want to talk about, you know, really the online resources that the ISA 100 has to offer. Um, there's great tools online. If you haven't visited already, you know, join the ISA a 100 wireless interest group on LinkedIn. And please, you know, check out the website. Um, we have a bunch of different um, end user stories, forums, um, things that, that can help you with your applications. So if you're looking to use the ISA 100 wireless, you know, take a look at the our LinkedIn group, um, as well as, you know, take a look on the website. You know, and again, as I just mentioned, if you haven't joined already, you know, please join uh, the LinkedIn interest group. Uh, we actually have a limited time offering right now that if you do join the wireless um, LinkedIn interest group, you have a chance to win a free iPad. So please, I encourage you to join. Um, reach out to Michael Brazda and, and he can help you get set up here. But um, we're trying to grow our, our LinkedIn interest group and, and the ISA 100 wireless uh, network. So we encourage you to join and and um, and please don't miss out on the opportunity to, to win a free iPad. Now I just want to I want to talk briefly about the WCI ISA 100 wireless RDK. Um, the RTK stands for Rapid Development Kit. And um, the, the WCI RD, RDK includes everything needed to swiftly develop an ISA 100 compliant instrument. So if you're looking to come out with a new um, product that uh, relates to the ISA 100, this kit can really help you uh, get the ball rolling. Um, it includes you know, application processor source code um, that enable, enables user to develop an instrument with minimal engineering effort. And it also includes um, 10 hours of free engineering support services. So again, you know, if you have anything that you're looking to, to release with the ISA 100, um, you know, look at this RDK kit that's been put together by the WCI ISA 100 group and uh, we'll be happy to help you out. So again, everyone, uh, really just, just wanna thank you all for attending the webinar today. Um, please, you know, as, I, as I've mentioned, you know, check us out on the ISA 100 WCI website. You know, please join us on the uh, LinkedIn WCI group. And um, again, we really appreciate your time. You know, thank you for, for learning about our wireless steam trap monitors and the ISA 100 infrastructure. Um, we were proud partners with the ISA 100. And, um, you know, we look forward to working together with you. And um, if, if you have any questions at this time, you know, we'll, we'll open the floor for some Q&A. And again, uh, my name is Brian Armstrong, as well as uh, my colleague, TJ Secord. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, TJ. Uh, folks are already submitting their questions, so let me scroll up to the top here. There's quite a few, and we can go ahead and get started. Okay, our first question from Ram. Um, is there a minimum pipe diameter or flow rate where remote monitoring is cost effective? Is the same monitoring hardware uh, 
Rather, is the monitoring hardware the same regardless of pipe size? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And, and the answer is that uh, the mounting hardware would be the only difference uh, as far as the requirement goes. So we have a, a clamp that we call a waveguide that would clamp onto the inlet of the steam trap. And um, you would just simply clamp that to the trap, uh, to the piping on the trap, and then the monitor is universal. It would go on any of those pipe sizes. Um, and then as far as the other part of your question where if, is there a, a payback based on the, the pipe size? And the answer there is, is no, not really. It, it doesn't, uh, it's not reliant on that. So um, it's, it's kind of a reverse logic scenario. So if you have a large trap that's typically like a monitoring a, a process or something like that, it's got a heavy, heavy load to it. Um, versus a small a drip trap that's up in your your trace or in your on your steam main that's operating at high pressure a lot of times that has a very high loss potential even though it's a small trap just because it's operating at such a high pressure so um sometimes the the small traps can be even a bigger waster than the bigger ones because they operate at a lower pressure typically thank you tj Go on to the next question. The next question is from Steve. Does ISA 100 limit what communication protocols can be used for trap data? OPC, Modbus, Ethernet IP. Um, I can. Uh, I'll take a stab first. At this one, uh, Brian and TJ, and then you guys can mm -hmm. add on. One of the features that makes the ISA 100 wireless protocol unique in the marketplace is its tunneling feature. So. Um, any uh, communication protocol can be tunneled through the industrial wireless network. And indeed, there are some um, vendors now who are selling uh, IC100 wireless products that take advantage of this exact feature. Um, one of them is a very creative use of the Profi-Safe um, uh, language that's tunneled through the IC100 wireless network. And you can read more about that all on the IC100 wireless website. Brian and TJ, uh, if there's anything more you guys want to add to that, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Thanks, Michael, for bringing that up. And also, I would just say that uh, the great thing about the ISA network is that it is uh, an open protocol. So there's there's multiple vendors that uh, build the, the gateways or the the receivers on the back end, and they all have different features as far as what type of outputs available with the OPC or Modbus or um, you know all the other protocols that are available. So. There's a whole suite of options that are available from different uh, um, gateway and, and, and vendors. Thanks, TJ. Okay, mm -hmm. our next question is from Rom. Are there several monitoring systems in the marketplace? Are they all compliant with the ISA 100 standard? Yes, so um, there are uh, other manufacturers that, that build um, steam trap monitoring systems, um, and they are, uh, there's many that, there's there's a few, I should say, not many, uh, that are on the ISA network, as well as other types of, of wireless protocols as well. Um, so uh, the answer is, <laughs> I guess, yes. <laughs> Thanks, TJ. Okay, our next question is from Laureen. Does ISA wireless work on Suricata? I am going to apologize. I don't know what Suricata is. Yeah, Michael, I'm I'm not sure what that is either, but we can definitely find that out um, and, and look into that for Lorraine. Okay. Um, and Lorraine, we've uh, got your email address captured, so I can have the speakers revert back to you uh, offline. Apologies that would be about great. that one. Um, yeah, thank you. Next question is from Ram. What is the approximate cost of re remote monitoring systems? That uh, is is very dependent on the type of facility you have, the density um, of steam traps and things like that. Obviously, if you've got a, a large installation and you've got one monitor point in in you know one area and then hundreds of, of meters 
away, you've got another, obviously your infrastructure costs are gonna be very, very high for a, a low density type of population. Um, so they, they can vary greatly because of that. And then also if you're gonna monitor one trap versus, you know, 150 or you know 300 traps um, again you're you have to absorb that infrastructure cost and your cost per point um, versus uh, you know several points so um, that's a, a little bit of a tricky question to answer um, but let's say if we're going to be uh, in an installation that is um, you know a, a decent size you know 50 or so transmitters and of a, a relatively dense population you're, you're probably looking at um you know maybe fifteen hundred dollars a point um roughly that includes some of your infrastructure costs and things so um obviously that's going to vary greatly uh depending on your your particular situation Okay. Next question is from Yosef. What is the recommended sampling time for steam trap monitoring and how many units can be connected to one system? Great question. Um, so the recommended sampling time that we do um, with our transmitters out of the box is um, they sample every hour. So once an hour and uh, they actually are going to report into the to the uh, ISA system every five minutes just to maintain that, uh, that level of, of communication. Um, and that can be adjusted obviously to um, sample more often or to report in more often. But um, we found through, our, through several years of, of monitoring traps that a one hour sample rate um, gives you the, the resolution to monitor that trap, but not such a high resolution that you're going to have like a false reading because you've got a, a slug of a heavy load um, where it might, you know, uh, sound as though the trap's blowing through or something like that. So that's a good balance to keep your battery life maximized, but give you that resolution of data that, uh, that you need. And TJ, the second part of that question was how many units can be connected to one system? Oh, yes, I apologize. <laughs> like I thought there was a second part. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, again, that's going to be dependent on the receiver network. So, um, you know, again, the, the ISA network, it's a an open protocol and um, there are a lot of different manufacturers that manufacture the, the receivers and the, the field access points and things like that and it's going to be a function of those uh, components. So um, that, could, that could vary depending on the equipment that you have. I can, I can shed a little bit more light on that as well, TJ. Um, one of the, the features of ISA 100 Wireless that is unique and very interesting for folks looking at the steam trap monitoring application is its ability to scale um, as compared to uh, other competing standards. Um, the ISA 100 wireless has very attractive looking scalability uh, potential. It can get up to uh, the devices in the number of thousands connected um, into one wireless system. And when you're looking at uh, the steam trap monitoring application, it, it's, it wouldn't be um, too unusual to have a very high number of units in one network. So it's, it's very compelling in that regard. Absolutely. Thank you for the additional clarification. No worries. Okay, next question is from Armita. Um, what are the pro protocols supported by the product? So the the transmitter itself, um, our ST6700 is going to have the, the uh, wireless ISA output protocol. Again, the, the protocols on the back end um, with the OPCs or the Modbus or um, anything like that, um, that's going to be dependent on your on your receiver system um, and and what they have as far as capabilities. Okay, the next question is from Yosef. Do you plan to have a remote antenna option for steam trap monitoring? 
Um, currently, our antenna, it, it has the ability to um, rotate so that you can tune it to get maximum transmission distance. Um, and uh, we have discussed internally the, the idea of a remote antenna, but we have not, um, we don't have that option uh, to date, no. Okay, the next question is from Nito. In regards to installation time, what is the procedure for commissioning a steam trap monitoring device uh, mechanically and communications wise? Yeah, um, great question. So for um, for commissioning it mechanically, um, it's it's very very simple. It's two bolts that you just clamp onto the inlet piping of the steam trap. Um, you know, with a pair of gloves, you don't even need to shut the system down. Um, so you just clamp that on and uh, thread in the the transmitter. Uh, there's a power switch. You you turn the power on, and uh, you start your provisioning process into your uh, in your network. If you've already done the provisioning process to the network, it'll automatically join to that wireless network, and then um, and then just the integration work on the on the back end. So um, you know it, it can be done mechanically. It's certainly very very simple, very very quick. Um, and then uh, you know same thing with the with the provisioning process. Um, you get that that device to join that network and uh, and it, it, it's uh, talking to that receiver and um, you can integrate it into your system from there. Okay, the next um, question is from Safi. Actually, it's more of a comment. Um, she's asking, will there be a, will the slides as well as the recording of, of this presentation be made available? Yes, Safi, they will be. Uh, they both will be posted to our website within a few days, and you will also get a, a follow-up email um, from GoToWebinar after attending this um, with the link. So uh, you will get a copy of the slides as well as the presentation. Um, Safi's also asked for the contact information of um, you guys. Uh, and so Safi, the, their contact information is included in the slides, so you will get that. And they'll also get your email after this, so they will be in touch. Okay, next question is from Yosef. Uh, what about DTM for your unit? Uh, we do have a DTM file available for the devices. Uh, the, it's available on our website, um, and I can provide you a link to that so that it's easier to find. Um, if, uh, if Michael, if you can share me his email address, we'll share the link to that. Sure. Okay. The next question is from Philippe. Um, can this presentation be used to show to customers? Yes, I, I don't see why not. The presentation will be available on the uh, WCI website um, and you can download it and, uh, and, and use it and share it as you feel necessary. That'd be great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, the next question is from Amit. Hi, since most of the steam trap leaks, how is the instrument casing protected from the hot steam and moisture? Um, he's since saying basically he wants to know about the casing material. Yeah, so the casing material, it's going to be a, it's a powder coated uh, low copper aluminum, uh, cast aluminum um, product and uh, that has uh, seals. It's got O-ring seals on it to protect it from the heat. It's IP67 rated, I believe. Um, and uh, so, I mean, uh, you, you have hot condensate and stuff dripping on things. It can certainly cause uh, challenges and problems, but uh, the device is built in such a way that it it's uh, going to prevent intrusion of water uh, as much as possible. 
The next question is from Ram. What data is captured with remote monitoring? All right, so the remote monitor is going to um, share information from uh, that, that it has gathered. So it's going to give you your trap condition. Um, so the trap condition is going to be uh, your your main variable that, that is broadcast. And that's going to be a one, two, or a three. And then the, a one is okay, a two is cold, and a three is blow through. Um, and then it also has information about the temperature that it reads. It's just a stem temperature. It's a non-contact temperature. So it's not an accurate temperature, but it's going to be a temperature that indicates that there's steam present at the trap. Um, and then we also have a, um, a temperature set point that's programmed into the device. Um, our device is also, um, I'm trying to remember the, the name of it right now, um, but it's a security compliant. Um, so it's also going to uh, send information about high health diagnostics and, and things like that with uh, to the to the receiver as needed. The next question is from Rakesh. How do you identify where to mount a steam trap monitoring instrument? So in our IOM, we explain where uh, to mount the, the, the transmitter, but it's going to be on the inlet of the steam trap. Um, and uh, it's going to be within six inches or 15 centimeters of that steam trap. So we want to get, we're going to measure sound. And as with any sound, it dissipates as you get further away from the source. And so if we, if we mount too far away from the sound source, we're not going to be as accurate and be able to pick it up because it's too far away. Um, so we want to get it nice and close to that steam trap on the inlet of the trap so that we can identify if that trap is backing up condensate. It's going to go cold because um, it's going to cool to ambient conditions. So on the inlet, as close to the steam trap as possible. And then um, we'll, we'll, we've got some instructions on how to put it as far as orientation to the pipe um, because steam's hot and if you're in a hot environment that heat could go up into the transmitter um, so we want to put it on the bottom of the trap if you've got very very hot steam or high pressure steam so um, we help to eliminate that uh, that heat from going directly into the the transmitter itself and you know causing excess wear on the batteries and, and things like that that are a little more sensitive to the heat um, but the device is designed to be installed in environments up to 90, or I'm sorry, 70 degrees C. So that's like what 150 degrees roughly Fahrenheit. Um, so yeah, um, it's it's uh, detailed in the IOM beyond that. The next question is from Francesco. Does steam trap monitoring support steam traps of other vendors like Spirax or Besta? Yes, our monitor is going to listen to the trap acoustically um, and clamp onto that piping. That allows us to monitor any um, manufacturer or any style of steam trap. So it could be a disc trap or a thermostatic or a um, um, inverted bucket. So it, it monitors all of the, the range of, of products that are available. What's uh, the next question is from Boag. What is the difference to the Spirex Sarco wireless solution? On the wireless side, they also use IC100, so the difference must be at the waveguide, right? So there's going to be a couple of differences there, and I I am not an expert in their product, um, so I I can't comment too much on it. But um, you know, there's going to be obviously the the internals are going to be different. Um, <clears throat> the mounting method is going to be slightly different. The data that's sent through the ISA network is probably going to be different. Um, so. Yeah, there's there's going to be some differences there. The next question is from Amit. What's the minimum update rate for steam trap monitoring, and what is the battery life of the transmitter? So the, the minimum update rate is going to be uh, governed by 
the receiver and what it's capable to go down to. Um, I believe with many of them, it's probably going to be about four seconds. However, at that rate, you're obviously going to consume your battery much, much quicker. Um, if you put the, the update rate to our recommended um, five minutes sample rate at an hour, um, you're going to see a, a, a battery life of between three and five years um, and, and maybe even a little bit longer. Um, but if you start dropping that down with, with anything, you're going to, just like with anything, you're going to use more energy and therefore consume that battery much quicker. The next question is from Philippe. I see on your website that there are several different types of steam traps. Can you give us a word of explanation about these different models? Yeah, so um, there's different, different technologies of, of trapping steam. So you've got like an inverted bucket, you've got uh, float and thermostatic, you've got disc traps, um, and quite honestly, that explaining those models that's a completely different <laughs> webinar in which we could definitely go into detail and uh, spend several hours explaining but really what it comes down to is how they trap and separate the steam from the condensate um, and uh, um, and how they work and their strengths and their weaknesses each one of them just like with any technology it has its own strengths and weaknesses um, and so um, certainly, if you want to get into a conversation about those technologies more, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but that that is a completely other uh, presentation um, to, to really dive into those in, in detail. The next question is from Amit. Can we have redundant a redundant system for steam traps? How would the infrastructure be? So I, I assume by redundant system, you're talking about mechanically having a redundant system. So if the steam trap fails, another one could um, take over for it. And there are different ways to set that up um, where you've got like a, a trap that um, is set up higher in your system and one lower and, and that's your primary trap. If that one fails, the other trap will take over. Um, I've, I've seen systems that are like that, um, but obviously you've got more more costs with that. I've also seen it where people have installed a trap next to another trap and then you can just turn one on or off. Um, one thing you want to try to avoid is gang trapping, um, where you've got multiple traps, you know, um, discharging from the same piece of equipment that can cause irregular wear uh, on traps, and it can be really difficult to, to manage. Um, you know, just like if you have a, a pump and you run one all the time and the other one not off all the time, you're gonna have a lot of problems with the one. So um, there are different methods to, to address that from a mechanical side of things um, that, that other people have used. And I believe if you look at our on our website, there's some information about that on the Armstrong website um, that will discuss how to do that type of um, setup, as well as um, speaking with our our representatives um, around the world. They've all been trained in, in, you know, obviously steam trapping and things, so they would have a lot of feedback for you as well. This, this next question is from Kang. What is the maximum distance between the transmitter and the receiving station? Does the metal structures and steam plants cause uh, data error rates? And what method do you use to determine uh, the transmitter placement to be able to achieve nearly perfect data reception? Yes, yeah, so um, good question. Basically, the, the, the different types of structures and uh, 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 the obstructions are going to affect the, the signal differently. Um, metal is very good at reflecting the signal um, and also like it grounds it out as well. Um, and it's going to, you know, cause it to, to act different depending on the facility. Just like your cell phone, you go inside of a store and sometimes it drops off and sometimes it doesn't um, depending on the material that that structure is built from. Um, 
what we would do is we would typically uh, survey the site. Um, so we would go in and if, if that's a major concern, we would measure um, where that signal is strong and where it's, where it's weak and then adjust where the access points would be located um, so that we, we put a good strong signal to that location. So if you've got a good strong signal to that location, you're going to have um, very, very low data loss um, on the signal and have a good strong um, feedback to the, to the receiver and, and, and your uh, control system and, and whatnot. I think that was a three-part question. Did I get all three of them? I think you did. The, the last okay. part was what method do you use to um, determine your transmitters have nearly perfect data reception? I think you covered that. Yep. Yeah, that would be with a, a survey. Um, would be the the easiest way to do that, where we would take a transmitter and and have it sample and, and see how it responds to the to the local um, obstructions. <clears throat> The next question is from Ron. Does steam trap maintenance require dismantling and reinstalling monitoring system, or is it something that is permanently clamped to the pipe and not the trap itself? Yeah, so um, that's a that's a good question because a lot of times when when you remove the steam trap, some of the piping around it gets removed as well. So what you would want to do when you go to replace or repair that steam trap is just make sure that you remove the the transmitter from the piping as well as the clamp that's holding it on there. Um, and then when you get the new trap installed, you would just clamp that to the new trap and, um, you know, uh, make sure it's turned on and, and uh, it will can, it'll start monitoring that trap. Um, if you have inf any information about the old trap in your system, you know, saying what type of trap it was or whatever, you may need to update that information, but from the from the uh, ST6700 Armstrong transmitter um, point of view, you don't need to update anything. It uh, it will recognize the new trap and start monitoring that for you automatically. Next question is from Arvind, and you may have covered this already, TJ. How does Armstrong ensure the coverage of the wireless network? Yep, uh, again, that would be um, an RF survey uh, for that, uh, the, the field access points and things like that. So uh, one of the great things about the ISA wireless system is it has wired and, and wireless access points that can be put out into, your, into the field. And so your gateway, um, is sitting in your control room or in your um, instrumentation room, and then you've got those access points that get installed out in the field, and you can place those in a location that's going to be most beneficial for that wireless network to communicate. And so those will all talk home to your gateway, and from there it goes to your control system. Okay, this question is from Ahmet. How much distance between the wireless transmitter? Um, Sorry, I need to make sense of this. Uh, how much distance between the transmitter from field to receiver? Yeah, so um, again, that's going to vary depending on obstructions. Um, you know, if, if you've got heavy obstructions, lots of steel that's in the way, things like that, it could be, you know, uh, less than 100 meters. But uh, say if you've got open field, um, with almost no obstructions, we could go, you know, over a thousand meters. So, uh, I'm sorry, over a thousand feet, not meters. Um, so, it, it does. It's going to really be dependent on the level of, of obstructions and the type of obstructions that are in the way. So, that's a hard question just to give you an answer, a number on. Um, so, it it depends. Would be. <laughs> would be the best answer. I apologize. I, I like to give a more defined answer than that, but it, it really does. It really depends on the type of obstructions that you have in your facility. The next question is from Anand. What type of stream steam trap is more useful nowadays for refineries and at power plants? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So the, the different types of steam traps that you install um, are going to depend uh, greatly on your application. Um, you know, the, the different steam traps have different qualities that, that uh, work well in different applications. So for example, if I have a drip trap um, where I've got a lot of dirt and scale that is coming to it, the inverted bucket, it works great for that. Um, if I have a modulating load, um, like a heat exchanger, the F and T is going to work very well for that because that has that thermostatic element to get rid of any air that's in the system. And it also uh, deals very well with a modulating or, or changing load that's caused by those. Um, we do have uh, a best practices um, definition in, on our website, on the Armstrong website at armstronginternational.com. Um, that goes into detail about how, what technology of steam trap to use in what application. So um, we do have some, some information available there. The next question is from Rom. Given the acoustic technology is the same monitoring system usable to detect compressed air leaks? That is a very good question. And um, if you are trying to detect compressed air leaks on like a liquid drainer or something like that, it, it may work. Um, we would obviously have to change some, some settings as far as the temperature goes. Um, however, if you're just trying to put it on the line and detect an air leak that's, you know, 100 feet away, um, it's not going to do a very good job because it's too far away. It just it, it doesn't pick up that noise. Again, uh, too far from the source, it can't hear the sound. Okay, the next question is from Chris. Are your batteries replaceable in hazardous environments? Yes, the batteries are designed to be replaced in a hazardous location. So there's no need to remove the device from the field. You can simply uh, unscrew the back cap for the battery, remove the battery, install a new battery, inspect the O-ring to make sure that it's not damaged or, or cracked or broken in any way, replace the cap, and go on your merry way. Um, you do not need to remove it in a hazardous environment. The next question is from Boak, and I think it touches on uh, some of what you just said, TJ. Is there a version for hazardous areas available? If yes, what are their certificates? FM, UL, ATEX, IEC, EX, and is the battery replaceable in the field? Yep, so very good question. And I didn't mention it in my presentation. I apologize. Um, yes, the device is class one, div one rated, um, as well as ATEX zone zero rated. Um, and uh, I won't bore you with all the different certifications. I, honestly, I don't know that I've memorized all the certification bodies that we went through, but all of that um, information can be is available on our website. We, I can say that we did go through UL for those certifications. Um, so they're all listed on the website, but class one, div one, and ATEX zone zero, um, I'm sorry, Glass 1, Div 1, Groups A through G, that might be better uh, for you. So it can go pretty much anywhere, and then ATEX Zone 0. The next question is from Jake. Is there any restrictions or limitations due to cold weather in regards to battery life or functionality of the transmitter? So cold weather, uh, the, the device for our ATEX rating, we are rated from negative 40 degrees C to positive 70 degrees C. So um, there's a pretty wide range. Um, you might, when we start seeing those lower temperatures or those higher temperatures, we might see a, a decrease in battery life just because, you know, that, that type of environment is very, very hard on batteries. Um, that's, that's a physical limitation of the chemistry in the batteries. Um, but uh, um, otherwise, that is our our rating that we have on the device. So negative 40 to positive 70. Um, the nice part about the negative 40 rating is we are on steam, so it's warm. So usually, even if the ambient temperatures 
at those lower extreme temperatures, our device is going to be a little bit warmer than that because um, of the application that it's monitoring. This question is from Rom. Have any utilities offered financial incentives to help fund this technology? So I've, I've received some mixed feedback from that. Um, I believe I have heard of some utilities um, that do have incentive programs for that. Um, however, I, I, I will say that many of the utilities and those those programs vary greatly from from location to location and, and region to region. So um, just because they're available in in one area doesn't mean they're going to be available in another um, because you may have a different utility supplier and things. But the answer is yes, I have heard of some of them doing it. Um, and uh, the the best way to tell would be to check with your utility provider or um, with our local rep. Uh, to see if um, if they have any information available for that. Okay. This question is from Germano, and uh, I think this repeats a little bit of something you said before, TJ. Germano may have, have missed that. What is the battery life, and is it possible to replace it in explosion area? Is it possible to use commercial batteries? Yes, so um, the battery life, uh, depending on what your settings are, um, if you follow our recommendation of five minutes for the update rate, um, you're going to see a battery life of approximately three years, maybe as much as five years. Um, and then uh, the battery can be replaced in a hazardous environment. We have that rating, so you just remove the cover and replace that battery. Um, the battery is not openly available. It is a Armstrong um, battery pack with uh, the circuitry built in to allow us to do that. That's why you can replace that battery in a hazardous environment. Okay, guys, that looks like it's the last of our questions. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, TJ and Brian, I want to thank you for today's great presentation, and beha on behalf of the IC100 Wireless Compliance Institute, I want to thank everybody who dialed in to today's webinar. I know we went um, about seven minutes over our scheduled time, and we still have quite a few uh, folks on the call here, so I'm glad today's presentation was of interest to you all. Uh, like we mentioned previously, the slide deck and the recording will be available on the ISC 100 wireless website. It'll be in the webinar section. Um, it's in the Learning Center, and then you go to Learning Center, and then you'll see the webinar section right there, um, all easily found from the splash page. Uh, so thanks again, guys. Have a great day. If it's lunchtime for you, like it is for me, have a great lunch. And if not, um, have a great rest of the day, and talk to you guys later. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all. Bye.